Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the PhD Chamber of Commerce and Industry and the Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry, it's my proud privilege to welcome all of you to this celebration of Azadi Kamrit Mahotsav and remembering and celebrating the great legacy of Netaji Shabhash Chandra Bose. With the Second World War raging across Europe and Asia, an American journalist, Louis Fisher, had come to see Mahatma Gandhi in early June 1942. The young American was puzzled by the Indian reluctance to line up unambiguously on the side of the Allies against the Axis powers. Hosted for a week in Gandhi's guest house, a one-room mud hut with an earthen floor and bamboo roof in the village of Seva Gram, Fisher had a series of candid conversations with the Mahatma. What Fisher learned about Shubhash Chandra Bose from Khurshed Ben, or sister Khurshed, who was deputed by Gandhi to take care of his guest, was startling to say the least. Khurshed Nauroji was the granddaughter of Dadabhai Nauroji, a founding father of our nationalist movement and the first Indian member of the British House of Commons in the late 19th century. For the last 15 years, she had been a constant disciple of Gandhi, the apostle of nonviolence. If, if Bose entered India at the head of an Indian army, Khurshid Ben told Fisher he would rally the whole country. Bose, according to the 40-year-old lady, was, I quote from her writings, way more popular than Nehru and in several circumstances had a more stronger and extraordinary appeal than her guru, the Mahatma Gandhi. India, Shubhas Chandra Bose wrote to his mother in 1912 when he was only 15 is, quote, God's beloved land. Bhagavanir Boro Adurate Sthan. His discovery of India, unlike Pandit Nehru's, occurred very early in his life. As the letters to his mother reveal, his love for his country was at this stage tinged with a religious sensibility and expressed as devotion to the mother. He asked her, quote, Will the condition of our dear country continue to go from bad to worse? Will not any son of Mother India in distress, in total disregard of his selfish interests, dedicate his whole life to the cause of the mother? Reverence for Bose was not limited to the radical elements of the Indian National Congress who were clamoring for independence, Purna Swaraj, from British rule. Mahatma Gandhi best captured the significance of the armed struggle of, for freedom that Netaji led from 1943 to 1945. The court-martial of the leading officers of Netaji's INA at the Red Fort had just transmitted the story of the Indian National Army and its Netaji to every Indian home, which was kept as a close-guarded secret by our British masters from the common mass. The whole country has been roused, Gandhi observed, and even the regular forces have been stirred into a new political consciousness and have begun to think in terms of independence. The man whom Bose has been the first to hail as the father of our nation regarded his rebellious son then as a prince among patriots. Netaji's name, he said, is one to conjure with. His patriotism is second to none, he wrote in the Harijan on the 12th of February, 1946. The lesson that Netaji and his army brings to us, the Mahatma said, is one of self-sacrifice and unity, irrespective of class and community and discipline. 
Ladies and gentlemen, today is a very special day. It is only befitting that we hold this meeting today, 82 years ago, in about, how much? In about nine hours from now, on a wintry night of January 16, 17, 1941, Shubhas Chandra Bose made his great escape from his Elgin Road mansion, not too far away from this place where we are standing at Dalhousie Square. And as the Wanderer car, number BLA 7169, drove out of that historic driveway, chariotted by his young nephew, Shishir Kumar Bose, a new chapter in India's freedom struggle unfolded. But what was most important was the transformation of Shubhash Chandra Bose, the fiery patriot, into our only warrior statesman, Netaji, at the head of the INA to liberate his motherland and to put the last nail firmly on the coffin of British imperialist rule in India. I find a close parallel between Shubhash Chandra Bose going out into the wilderness to look for liberation of his motherland of the liberation of his own people with another prince called Siddhartha who left the royal palace 2,500 years ago, got lost and came and returned to ourselves as the Buddha. Ladies and gentlemen, with these few words, let us begin today's most important meeting where we, as we celebrate Azadi Ki Amrit Mahutsav and remember the legacy of the great patriot Shubhash Chandra Bose. May I take this opportunity to invite on stage Sri Yashashwi Shroff, Chair, PhD CCI West Bengal State Chapter, <laughs> Shishorov Sanyal, Secretary General, PhD CCI. The President of the Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industries, Managing Director, Chief Executive Officer, Excite Industries Limited, uh, Mr. Shubir Chakraborty. <laughs> the President Designate of the Bengal Chamber, Executive Director, HR and Admin, CESC Limited, President HR Power Group, RPSG, Sri Gautam Roy. And finally, a big hand for the guest of honor of this meeting, Sri Sanjeev Sanyal. <laughs> Eminent economist, academic and historian, member of the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister and honorary member of the Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And Mr. Vineet Nahata, would you also kindly join us up here on stage? From the PhD CCI, ladies and gentlemen, we shall now take a look at an audiovisual presentation remembering Netaji.
So with that audiovisual tribute to India's great warrior statesman, I have often referred to him as our first soldier in our last war for independence. Uh, we shall now uh, hear the theme address from Sri Yashashvi Shroff, Chair of the PhD Chamber of Commerce and Industry, West, Beng West Bengal State Chapter. Thank you. Dr. C. V. Ananda Bose, Honorable Governor of West Bengal, will be with us shortly. Sri Sanjeev Sanyal, economist and historian, member, Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister. Sri Madhi Anita Bose Faf, daughter of Netaji and senior economist. Sri Chandra Kumar Bose, grand nephew of Netaji and convener, the open platform for Netaji. Sri Subir Chakravarti, President of the Bengal Chamber. Sri Gautam Ray, President designate the Bengal Chamber, Sri Saurabh Sanyal, Secretary General, PhD CCI, Sri Subodip Ghosh, Director General, the Bengal Chamber, team members of PhD CCI and the Bengal Chamber, ladies and gentlemen, and the representatives of media. All esteemed participants, namaskar and good evening. With greatest sense of respect and gratitude, here we are, paying our homage to our greatest freedom fighter. Sri Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose. My sincere compliments to the PhD CCI leadership and team members for initiating a very important commemorative lecture series celebrating the 125th birth anniversary of a great freedom fighter, Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose, and 75th year of our independence, Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav. As the chair of PhD CCI West Bengal State Chapter, it is indeed a big privilege to be here as we are commencing with the second lecture of Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose Memorial Lecture Series today. And I welcome you all in the first in Kolkata Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose Memorial Lecture to celebrate Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav on the 75th year of India's independence and glorious legacy of Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose. I deeply appreciate the fact that we all are here today to broadly reflect on Netaji's exemplary contributions for India's freedom struggle and the strength he provided with his leadership that immensely helped India to get independent in 1947. While I'm here with you all today, I am looking back at the time when Netaji and other brave freedom fighters were giving a tough challenge to the most brutal rule of the British Empire that was always at fault in keeping the exploitation of India and Indians as their key aims. Looking back, we all Indians have a sense of pride in what we have achieved since 1947. We must celebrate a, gro a glorious journey as Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav and keep the resolve to continue working together for nation making and deepening India's footprints across the globe. As a peaceful country and one of the fastest growing economies of the world, India offers a great hope a great hope today, and our concerted efforts will further vitalize its prominence in the world order. When our priorities are to keep India and the world safe from the severe challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic and the unprecedented operational disruptions, we at PhD CCI are determined to continue working in close tandem with the government and contribute to the holistic efforts for rebounding our economy and serving humanity. Honorable PM Sri Narendra Modi has come up with Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhiyan that aims to foster the local entrepreneurial ecosystem and export potential in India. While relying on self-reliance for, realis for realizing our own actual potential, the Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhiyan is not aimed to lessen India's deep engagement with the rest of the world. Rather, the mission is clearly aimed to open the world of opportunities from India. Also, I am most grateful and thankful to our respected CM, Srimanti Mamta Banerjee, under whose leadership not only the GDP of the state has grown many fold, but also the real estate industry, which has seen a massive growth and boom due to special initiatives taken under her leadership, such as rebates in stamp duty and circle rates. Furthermore, she has created about 12 million jobs during her tenure 
and about 1.2 million self-help self -help groups have been formed where government provides money and credit and it's transferred directly from the treasury to the bank accounts of the beneficiaries named as Lakshmi Bhandar and Kanya Sri Yojana. During her tenure, we have seen many smiling faces amongst women, students, farmers, skilled, semi-skilled people, which she ensures through her women empowerment, farmers development, and social scheme programs. India is already moving on the trajectory, which will lead it further to the higher and sustained economic growth, and that too, superlatively supported by equity and justice emanated through the grace of its remarkable democracy, positive attributes of federalism, and success stories from across the country. While working for inclusive economic growth, we must also think about sustainability. We should reimagine the world as a better place to live in. PhD CCI shall continue to work towards making the world a better place to live in through its initiatives at the grassroots level. If the above shared objectives are achieved, India will soon become a developed country. PhD CCI's over 150,000 industry members across the country are together in this mission and to make such a transformation happen. As a forward-looking industry chamber, PhD CCI welcomes the consultations and collaborations for making a robust and prosperous ecosystem for the country, organization, members, and our officials. Moving forward, we are trying our level best to keep India's inclusive growth momentum on. In the process, we are open to engage with the industry fraternity across the world to carry forward the mission of creating shared prosperity, following our national principle of Vasudeva, of Vasudeva Kutumbakam. At PhD CCI, we stand with the causes that support the universal interest and serve humanity unswervingly. Here, we look forward to getting inspiration from all corners to overcome the ongoing tough phase and come out stronger to make the region and the world better livable and suited for sustainable economic activities. PhD CCI, a leading industry chamber, keeps a unique focus on public policy matters and works in tandem for fostering, for fostering government industry interface in India and supporting a robust ecosystem for businesses. Through policy advocacy, dialogues and publications, it pitches for further simplifying the official procedures and making them transparent at decision-making levels with greater interface of technology. Also, it proactively supports India's economic reforms mission. India has a prime minister who is on the mission of making the country achieve its true potential. Under his leadership, the government, industry, and each Indian will make it happen. At the cusp of decisive changes, we all must play our part for Atmanirbhar Bharat. We are all fortunate to contribute our level best in national interest through our concerted efforts. Let's take our country to greater heights. Each and every Indian should get the benefits of the nation's progress. This is our vision on India's 75 years of glorious journey since its, since its independence and as a democracy. Thanking you all for all being here and contributing to the deliberations today. Jai Hind. Ladies and gentlemen, domestic bliss has never lasted long in the life of a revolutionary. Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose was no exception. If Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose was successful in taking the flight to East Asia from Rome as it was originally scheduled, in the week beginning the 6th of November 1942, he would have missed forever the most joyous event of his life. It was because of the disagreement between the Japanese and the Italians on the use of the airspace by Bose for his passage to Rangoon. This brief disappointment was overcome with immense joy with the birth of his only child, Anita, on the 29th of November in Vienna. Anita has just turned 80 and lives in Augsburg, in Germany, near München. Netaji could spend just two and a half months 
in family bliss with his wife, Emilie, and daughter, Anita, enjoying just one quiet Christmas in 1942 and his birthday on the 23rd of January 1943 before he left the Kiel Harbour for the historic submarine voyage for 90 days to East Asia in search of his motherland's liberation, leaving behind home and hearth his wife Emilie and the two and a half month old Anita. He was destined never to see her again. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a recorded address from Anita Bose Buff from Augsburg at this point in time. We welcome Professor Anita Bose Buff, daughter, the only child of Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose. Netaji was born 125 years ago. He passed away almost 77 years ago, unfortunately without having seen his beloved motherland India independent. Therefore we might say that he was a man of a different era, not of today. However, there was some magic about him that lets him appear forever young forever timeless. Even today, how else can we explain that after all these years, many of his countrymen and countrywomen, the men and women of another era of today, not only remember him as a historic figure, but beyond that, he is able to imbibe an unbelievable feeling of respect, of admiration, of wonder, and even love in many Indians today. People who have never seen him personally, who could never experience the magnetism of his personality. It's amazing. Of course, I may be biased in getting this impression. Like everyone, I live in a bubble, and in this bubble of information in which I live, People who are enchanted by Netaji seek to contact uh, me. They hope to sort of get a second-hand contact to Netaji through this. Obviously, those who are critical of him and who uh, and and uh, critical of his actions, or those who do not remember him at all, would not come and tell me about him. Uh, would not come and tell me about their sentiments and their criticism. But even though not all Indians remember Netaji today and not all remember him with admiration, a surprisingly large number still does. They remember him in a very personal and emotional way even. I continue to be amazed by this phenomenon, but at the same time I feel very grateful for it because I feel that he has deserved these sentiments. He who has sacrificed so much for his country and his countrymen and countrywomen, uh, even his life is thereby rewarded. 75 years ago, my father did not live to see India become independent. You might see a great tragedy, but on the, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, it may be a boon because he did not have to witness the tragedy of India's partition. He would have opposed this partition with all his determination. He had warned against the British rulers' intention of divide and rule, of their continuing emphasis on communal division in India. But in all fairness, we must admit that tragically and shamefully as it may be, there were enough Indians of all creeds for that matter to share that unfortunate demand <coughs> for partition and along communal lines. It resulted not only in millions of refugees, but also in 
hundreds of thousands of dead Indians in 1947. Indians murdered by Indians. And communal violence and conflict, even wars, have been the consequence of this development. Like Mahatma Gandhi, Netaji opposed the partition of India along communal lines. He would have been equally horrified to experience the atrocities his countrymen and countrywomen inflicted upon each other. One might say his untimely death spared him a heartbreak. would cooperate in mutual respect towards the well-being of all. This involved specifically three aspects. First, the relationship between women and men. Second, the relationship between members of different castes and different creeds. And third, the relationship of Indians of all regions. Neta, you expected that such a social fabric would provide the necessary basis for the successful cultural, political and economic development of India after independence. Netaji's efforts in the struggle for India's independence showed that these ideals were no mere words to him, but that he was determined to put them into action. In fact, he practiced these ideals during his campaign in the Far East, starting from Singapore in 1943 up to his flag hoisting on Indian soil in 1944 and the subsequent military defeat and retreat up to the end of the armed struggle and his death in 1945. And of course, he had also practiced it in Europe before that. Netaji was a staunch believer in the equality of men and women. And both with regards to privileges as well as with regard to duties. In fact, he even established the first women's corps in the armed forces. Even today, it is, there is hardly a country where gender equality has been achieved, especially not uh, in the armed forces. India, even today, has a far way to go with regard to gender equality, even though some headway was made since the 1940s, no doubt. There are women in all highly qualified professions today. India was in fact one of the first countries with a female head of government, Indira Gandhi. At least the educated families believe in educating their daughters, not only their sons. Netaji had propagated this in his own family in the 1920s already. He would, however, feel deeply ashamed that India still has the reputation as the country with the highest degree of violence against women in the world, even today. That's hardly a matter to be proud of. Nitaji practiced the equality and mutual respect of members of all castes and of all creeds in his provisional government of Free India, which was proclaimed on October 21, 1943, and in the Indian National Army. While separate Hindu tea and Muslim tea had been served in the British Indian Army, the soldiers of the Indian National Army fought together, ate together, and celebrated their respective religious festivals together. Netaji made it a point to have members of all creeds cooperate in their efforts. With regard to the regions, we can say that members of all regions in India cooperated in the struggle for independence. South Indians and North Indians, East Indians and people from the West of India. The Indian expatriates, we would call them 
non-resident Indians or NRIs today provided major human and economic resources for the struggle of India's independence. Netaji tried to choose one Indian lingua franca, cutting across the region, so to say, for free India, Hindustani, as a mix between Hindi and Urdu written in the Latin script. Looking at Netaji himself, we can say Netaji was a Bose, he was a devout Hindu, he was a Bengali, but with regard to his aspirations and his identity, he made all Indians his family. As a devout Hindu, he could respect all other religions and recognize their common values. And beyond being a son of Bengal, he saw himself as the son of India. Or in view of the partition, I should rather say the Indian subcontinent. Keep in mind what these characteristics meant in 1945 and what they might mean today. It's not the same thing really, because uh, circumstances have changed. Following the end of World War II, we could observe a trend towards universalism or multilateralism throughout the world, the wish to overcome strife and wars permanently. The UN as a peacekeeping undertaking entailed high hopes in 1945 and a monetary order according to the Bretton Woods Agreement of 1944 held optimistic expectations for the world's monetary and economic order. Of course, the monetary order has changed since then and the UN is not terribly effective whenever the major power uh, is concerned and their interests are at stake. But soon two blocks occurred under the leadership of the United States on the one hand and the Soviet Union on the other. And therefore the universalist ideas could not be realized uh, to a large extent. There was practically uh, no time when the world at large was at peace. The fact that independent, I should say rest India, chose to be uh, one of the leading nations of the so-called non-aligned countries not a member of one of the two blocks I mentioned before, was I think very wise. Choosing her pass as free, democratic, secular country made India akin to the Western bloc, so to say. Choosing a more state-controlled or administratively controlled economy, at least uh, up to the early 1990s, made her at the same time akin to the socialist or communist economies. It is likely that Netaji would have chosen and supported a similar path for India had he been involved in post-independence politics. After all, he and uh, the later Prime Minister uh, Jawaharlal Nehru were two modern leftist leaders in the 30s and 40s, more or less of the same generation. Netaji had always been an internationalist. Some opponents of Netaji criticized him as being a fascist himself for supposedly sympathizing with fascists. But his interest in other countries was guided by the wish that they would support India's struggle for freedom. It was he who actively sought the contact with and support of other countries in India's struggle. However, these international contacts were motivated by political expedience and not by ideological kinship. India's freedom struggle was the sole motivation for cooperating with countries like Japan, Germany and Italy. In those days, these were all fascist countries with questionable values and track records. In no way did their values and practices conform to Netaji's own values and political convictions as a socialist 
or in today's diction, maybe a social democratic politician. But which countries, after all, were willing to support a struggle against the British Empire in the early 1940s? The Soviet Union was unwilling to support NATO in 1941. And of course, after the German attack on the Soviet Union in June 1941, she became an ally of Britain, automatically more or less. Netaji was at least supported in his struggle by Germany, Italy and Japan, since they were the opponents of Britain at the time. Germany continued to discriminate against Indians at the same time, but also uh, provided a half-hearted support to the Indian struggle for independence. Japan had played a similar aggressive role vis-à-vis -vis other nations in Asia as Germany had done in Europe, but seemed to support Netaji in his struggle even though their values did not coincide in many matters. We may well conclude that Netaji would have kept an open mind to internationalism and multilateralism for free India. After the experience of colonialism, it is however safe to assume that he would not have been willing to subject India to the sole dominance of one country, be it the United States of America or the Soviet Union. Today, India is one of the five major economic powers and thereby political players. Along with the United States of America, China, the European Union, and Russia. Its large population provides a large domestic market which makes it to a degree independent in the world. Universalism was partly superseded by regionalism and multiple centers of economic power. We can assume that Netaji would have advocated a strong proactive role for India in this international concert. In, 19, uh, in uh, 75 years, India has gone through many challenges. She met some of them successfully, others less than what was expected in 1947 and before. The primary commitment to the struggle for freedom of poverty, illiteracy and ill health and for human rights of all men and women continue, and they will always continue in some way or other. And some new challenges, like the climate crisis and pollution, have emerged, which threaten the entire world. The freedom fighters of those days, to some extent, lived in a different world, but the values for which Netaji stood and had uh, have not become obsolete and the integrity of the freedom fighters of those days should not be forgotten but regained. Jai Hind. One interesting fact from Professor Anita Bose's uh, in various uh, uh, comments was that bit about Hindu tea and Muslim tea. So when the Mahatma went to meet the INA uh, prisoners of war, uh, as uh, when they were at the Red Fort, said that we used to be given in the British camps Muslim tea and Hindu tea. When Netaji came to lead us at the head of the INA, we used to have the Muslim tea and the Hindu tea, we used to mix them together and then we used to partake of the tea. So, so that was what uh, the Mahatma was told straight on when, they came, when he came to see them at the Red Fort Trials, 1945, which of course raised such an uproar throughout the country that the uh, Ocean Lake Auchenlick had to call off, uh, Claude Auchenlick uh, had to call off the trial 
and release the three great leaders and the other prisoners of war. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, we shall now hear another recorded address from Chandra Kumar Bose. Uh, he is the convener of the open platform for Netaji. Uh, as far as family connection is concerned, he is a grand nephew of the leader. He is the grandson of uh, the great leader Sharat Chandra Bose, Netaji's uh, uh, mentor and Mejo Dada, his older brother, and of course son of uh, Omiyo Bose, uh, ambassador of India to Burma in the late 1970s, Chandra Kumar Bose. Honorable Governor of West Bengal, Dr. C. V. Ananda Bose, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we are assembled here today to pay homage to Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose, the liberator of India, on his 126th birth anniversary. We are grateful to PhD Chamber of Commerce to arrange this commemorative theme, Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav, and glorious legacy of Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose. Netaji was a very spiritual person, deeply inspired by the teachings of Swami Vivekananda. His ideology of man-making and character building were implemented by Netaji in his Indian National Army. Netaji was a social thinker. His views on social reconstruction of India must be studied and analyzed by the youth of our nation. A political activist, he plunged into Mahatma Gandhi's nonviolent freedom movement in 1921 and later on realized that only an armed struggle can bring about freedom to his motherland. An economic planner, it was Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose who established the first planning committee of India in 1938 when he was the president of the Indian National Congress. His economic views and thoughts must be also understood and it should be studied by economic students. People who study economics must understand his concept of a free India. He fought for political economic and social freedom. We have probably attained political freedom, but we are still a far cry away to realize Shubhash Chandra Bose's ideal, his desire and wishes for economic and social freedom. He was a soldier who fought for India's freedom as the supreme commander of the Indian National Army. A master strategist, his strategy was extremely successful when the Indian soldiers in the, and the Bharatiyas in the INA revolted against the British High Command. The subsequent INA trials in 1946 completely destroyed the loyalty and allegiance of the British forces to the British High Command. A visionary, Netaji's thought of social reconstruction, democracy, a secular India must be understood and practiced by present 
leaders of our India and the Indian subcontinent. Netaji was the only leader who gave recognition and equal status to women. It was Subhash Chandra Bose who formed the Rani of Jhasi Regiment. And in the 1940s, women could fight along with the men for the freedom of our motherland. Netaji is the only leader who could unite all communities as Bharatiyas, which is extremely relevant in present-day India. What do we find today? Divisive politics? Communalism, vote bank politics, Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose would have never tolerated this division among people. So let us build India based on the ideology of Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose. Netaji realized that India is a country where there is unity through diversity and he practiced it. Paying homage to Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose on his 126th birth anniversary would only be meaningful if we inspire the youth of our country with his inclusive secular ideology, which is the only path to protect the concept of Bharat. With these words, I once again thank the PhD Chamber of Commerce for giving me an opportunity to share a few thoughts about the liberator of India, about Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose, the vision that he gave for independent India, the thoughts that he gave to unite all communities as Bharatiyas, and to take India towards this 21st century with progress and prosperity. Thank you. Jai Hind. We thank uh, Chandra Kumar Bose for that uh, beautiful, uh, uh, those beautiful uh, comments and observations on his grand uncle. And we uh, now await the arrival of our chief guest, uh, Dr. C. V. Ananda Bose, Honorable Governor of West Bengal. He's probably arrived at downstairs. He will soon join us here in the hall. As we await the arrival of uh, the Honorable Governor uh, amidst us, it would be pertinent to uh, carry on our deliberations uh, on this great leader. You see, so many, you see, two uh, family members of Bose, of course, I have known Anita Bose for many years. For uh, more than 30 years now, I have interviewed her extensively for India's national television channel, Doordarshan, way back in 1997. It was a one and a half hour interview. And uh, one of the most humble uh, you know, uh, persons that I have spoken to, considering her background, in fact, she said that you people have met many more men and women of Netaji than I have. What I have learned about my great father was from accounts 
of some of the men and women who I met in post-war Germany and uh, of course from my mother and my grandmother, means Netaji's mother-in-law. And uh, so there are various views uh, about the greatness of this great man. The view of Prabhash Chandra Bose as a warrior hero who snatched political victory for his country out of the jaws of his own temporary military setback. It's just possibly a partial glimpse of such a multifaceted personality. He was a warrior throughout his life. A warrior doesn't really always fight on battlefields. He has faced obstructions throughout his remarkable life. He was a warrior who paused between battles and often involuntarily in British prisons, no less than on 13 occasions, 11 occasions. And he gave expressions to his dreams for India and the global role that he saw for his country free of bondage. His lecture in 1938, the first time he was elected the president of the Indian National Congress where Chandra Kumar Bose was talking of the planning committee. That's where he spoke of his dreams of a planning committee of, for his country free of bondage. He, he gave a del, uh, an extensive account of his dreams for the global role that he saw for his country free of bondage. His spirit of service to suffering humanity had been inculcated very early in his life with the teachings of Swami Vivekananda. In public life, he transcended the boundaries of divisions among Indians in the manner of his political mentor, Deshobandhu Chittaranjan Das, making the cause of unity among his countrymen his top political priority. Ladies and gentlemen, Honorable Governor of West Bengal, Dr. C. V. Ananda Bose, we, we accord him a most warm welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, I uh, request you to kindly remain arisen. We shall now have the national anthem. Janagana manaya dhinayaka jaya he Bharat bhagya vidhata Punjab sindh gujarat maratha Dravid utkala banga Vindhya himachal yamuna ganga Uchal jaladhita ranga तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तव जय गाथा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 हे वी अकॉर्ड मोस्ट वॉर्म वेलकम टू ऑनरेबल गवर्नर ऑफ वेस्ट बंगाल डॉक्टर सी वी आनंद बोस सर वेलकम टू दिस वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट मीटिंग वेयर वी सेलिब्रेट आजादी के अमृत महोत्सव and the legacy of the great leader, Shubhash Chandra Bose. I shall now request Sri Shubhid Chakraborty, the President of the Bengal Chamber, Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer uh, of Excide Industries Limited, uh, to felicitate Dr. C. V. Anand Bose. And as well as Shishore of Sanyal, 
Secretary General, PhD, Chamber of Commerce and Industries, to present tokens of our deep appreciation as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. May I now call upon the President of BCC and I, Mr. Shubit Chakraborty, and the Managing Committee Member of PhD CCI, Mr. Vineet Nahata, to present tokens of our appreciation to our guest of honor, Sri Sanjeev Sanyal. Sri Sanjeev Sanyal, eminent economist and historian, member of the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister of India, Honorary Member of the Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industries. May I request uh, Shishaurav Sanyal, Secretary General of PhD CCI, for his welcome remarks. Thank you, Mr. Biplab. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Honorable Governor of West Bengal, Dr. C.V. Ananda Bose, our chief guest and keynote speaker, guest of honor, Sri Sandeep Sanyal, Sanjeev Sanyal, economist and historian, member, Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister, Srimati Anita Bose, daughter of Netaji and senior economist, who gave her presentation just before we started. Sri Chandra Kumar Bose, the grand nephew of Netaji and convener, the open platform for Netaji. Sri Shubir Chakraborty, president, the Bengal Chamber. Sri Gautam Roy, president designate, the Bengal Chamber. Sri Yasasvi Shroff, our chair of the PhD CCI, West Bengal State Chapter. Sri Shubodeep Ghosh, Director General, the Bengal Chamber, team members of PhD CCI and Bengal Chamber, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished delegates, representatives from the media, and my colleagues. Namaskar, good evening, all esteemed participants. We are very thankful to you all for being here this evening and making the deliberations remarkably successful. Our deep respect and gratitude to the Honorable Governor, Dr. C.V. Ananda Bose, and the Chief Guest and Keynote Speaker of today's very important program. Sir, we are extremely thankful to you for sparing your valuable time and encouraging us with your esteemed presence on this occasion. We look forward to your remarkable perspectives and insights during your keynote address. With greatest sense of respect and gratitude, here we are paying our homage to our great freedom fighter, Sri Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose. At the PhD Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the National Apex Chamber established in 1905, we felt very much inspired to initiate a commemorative lecture series, celebrating the 125th birth anniversary of a great visionary and freedom fighter, Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose. We commenced with the first lecture of Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose Memorial Lecture Series on the 19th of July 2022 at the Lakshmi Pat Singhania Auditorium at PhD House, New Delhi. I wish to wholeheartedly thank the President, the President-designate and the Director General Bengal Chamber and Ms. Sukanya, the Deputy Director, Amrita Basu and Abhishek Kaur and the entire team from Bengal Chamber for supporting PhD CCI in its initiative throughout the implementation of this outstanding event, which could not have been possible without them. A round of applause for the Bengal Chamber, please. I will request our chief guest and all the esteemed panelists 
to kindly release our guest of honor, Sri Sanjeev Sanyal's book, Revolutionaries, the other story of how India won its freedom. Followed by it, I will request Sanjeev to introduce the book and also deliver his address. Thanking you all for being here and contributing to the deliberations. But before that, I will also request I hand over to our Master of Ceremony, Viplop, for taking the further proceedings. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shaurav Sanyal, Secretary General, PhD CCI. Before we go into the book release of Sanjeev Sanyal, I will request uh, the President of the Bengal Chamber, Managing Director, Chief Executive Officer of Exide Industries, Mr. Shubhit Chakraborty, for his welcome remarks for the Honorable Governor. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this prestigious program on Netaji Shubhas Chandra Bose. The Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry is pleased to partner with PhD Chamber of Commerce and Industry in this endeavor. We are indeed extremely honored to have the gracious presence of Dr. C. V. Anunda Bosch, Honorable Governor of West Bengal, and Sri Sanjeev Sanyal, Member, Economic Advisory Council to the Honorable Prime Minister and Honorary Member of the Bengal Chamber. Sir, this is perhaps your first engagement with Bengal Chamber and I will hope that in the coming mm, months we shall have the honor of hosting you multiple times at our chamber for some prestigious programs. We are also delighted that Sri Sanyal's latest book, Revolutionaries, the other story of how India won its freedom, will be formally released today in Kolkata in this very forum. My first serious brush with Netaji's ideals and views came about when my mother encouraged me to read a book titled Ami Shubhash Bolchi by Sri Shoilesh Dei. It was in two volumes, and someone who was hooked onto Enid Blyton as a young school student in those days, I was not very sure what I was going in for, but having gone through the first volume, I could not resist going through the second, because I was simply amazed at the kind of energy of this gentleman known as Netaji. And that was such a revelation for me that it encouraged me in later years to read further about him. That a single person can achieve so much within a span of 50 years of his lifetime is simply amazing. Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose is in the collective consciousness of Indians for over a century now. We connect with the thoughts of Netaji with a sense of deep reverence. He gave a new dimension to the dream of freedom, Azadi, which is intensely entrenched in our minds even today. As I read about Netaji and hear about him, I cannot but feel that he was far, far ahead of his times. His ideas on gender equality, his ideas on religious equality, these were concepts which were completely new in the times that he lived. We now know that we are still struggling with some of these concepts in our day-to-day -day life. He was a visionary far ahead of his time who put forward a blueprint of the future of India in his famous Haripura address. He also mentioned about the importance of India's foreign relations. He talked of developing international contacts by Indian cultural organizations and by chambers of commerce in India to raise India's profile across the globe. 
The relevance of Netaji in the 21st century is in many ways self-evident. The concerns that he wanted to be addressed so many decades ago still need attention at national and international levels from poverty to inclusivity. Today's UN Sustainable Development Goals are all about an urgent call for action by all countries, developed and developing in a global partnership. They recognize that ending poverty and other deprivations must go hand in hand with strategies that improve health and education, reduce inequality, and spur economic growth, while tackling climate change and working to preserve our oceans and forests. For Netaji, young men and women formed the core human energy to achieve the goal of freedom. Even today, youth power is considered to be an asset for India to position it on the global map firmly. The government of India has christened Netaji's birthday as Parakram Divas, or the Day of Valor. Today's program is a tribute to the courage and passion of Netaji that drives the whole of India. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Subir Chakravarti, President Bengal Chamber, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> we are very pleased and honored to have amidst us Sanjeev Sanyal, the currently a member of the Economic Advisory Council of the Prime Minister and Secretary to the Government of India. He was the principal economic, economic advisor to the finance minister for five years till February 2022. He, was also, he also represented India on many international fora such as the OECD and the G7 and was the co-chair of the G20's framework working group. He was one of the main architects of the G20's global action plan that was used to coordinate the international response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Prior to joining the government, he spent over two decades in financial markets and was global strategist and a managing director at the Deutsche Bank. An alumnus of the Sri Ram College of Commerce, Delhi, Sri Sanya later attended Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar. He has had many affiliations, including being a visiting scholar at Oxford University and adjunct fellow at the Institute of Policy Studies, Singapore, a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society London, a visiting professor at JNU Delhi, senior fellow of the World Wildlife Fund. He was awarded the Eisenhower Fellowship in 2007 for his work on urban dynamics. In 2010, he was named as a young global leader by the World Economic Leadership Forum. He is the author of a number of best-selling books, including Land of the Seven Rivers, The Ocean of Churn, India in the Age of Ideas, and the Indian Renaissance. He has co-authored and edited six economic surveys of the government of India between 2017 and 2022. He has published more than 200 articles and columns in leading national and international publications <coughs> at the Bengal Chamber. We are very, very proud that he is an honorary member of the Chamber. We shall now uh, get going to release his books. As you all know that the revolutionaries ignited the national cause and carried the message of nationalism in the country and outside the country at a time when government repression left no peaceful avenues open for protest. These revolutionaries were prepared to make any kind of sacrifice for the cause of freedom. Uh, sadly, not much has been written extensively on the role of revolutionaries in making our dear country free, although they had a major role to play. So, we are grateful to Sri Sanyal for bringing out, for writing this book, Revolutionaries, the other story of how India won its freedom. We shall now do the formal release of this book. Shall we open the book, please? Uh, it's 
So there we go. Revolutionary is the other story of how India won its freedom. May I now request Shishonjeep Sanyal to uh, say a few words about the book and then your address as our guest of honor. Good evening, good evening, friends. Let me begin by thanking the Honorable Governor of the State of West Bengal, Dr. Bose. Let me also thank the organizers from both PhD Chamber of Commerce and the Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry uh, for organizing this wonderful event today. Um, also, uh, eminent members of the Bose family who addressed us. And of course, all of you for uh, making time uh, on uh, uh, January evening to come and uh, help me release the book, but also to listen um, to what I have to say. The reason I wrote this book um, and why it is relevant to um, the uh, Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose Memorial Lecture is that the story of India's freedom struggle, sadly, has been, at least in the official narrative and the more mainstream narrative, been presented as if it was some uniquely nonviolent movement that we politely asked the British to leave and they gently left. Yes, there were some occasional acts of individual bravery from the likes of Netaji or Bhagat Singh or Raj Bihari Bose or whoever happens to be your favorite revolutionary, but that they were really not part of the overall story. If anything, perhaps there were little bits of irritants along the way and that they didn't really have much of either a long-term strategy or any great impact on the outcome. Of course, these events are still, much of it even within living memory, people who are uh, alive who saw some of these events. So the names of many of these revolutionaries from Sri Aurobindo, Savarkar, Bhagat Singh, Sachindranath Sanyal, and so on, have not been forgotten, but you will get the impression that they carried out some odd act of individual resistance. But in fact, there is no real long-term history of armed resistance that India did that ultimately had any implications for our eventually getting free. Sadly, this is not the story that you would find if you went back into the archives and dug into the story as it was being witnessed at that time. The fact is that India had a very long history of armed resistance to British colonial occupation of this country. This went back to the 18th century. There was, of course, the Marathas, the Sikhs, and many others, culminating in the Great Revolt of 1857-58. That revolt failed, it is true. But the spark of rebellion did not end there. And it's really at the end of the 19th century that a new cycle of armed resistance begins to build up. And the book that I have published is called The Revolutionaries, The Other Story of How India Won Its Freedom, is their story. This story really takes off at the very end of the 19th century when new ideas from many different sources begin to bubble up. Some of these sources come from outside, like the ideas of Italian nationalism from Mazzini and Garibaldi, of Irish nationalism, or of Pan-Asianism from the Japanese, or of Hindu revivalism from um, the Arya Samaj or uh, Swami Vivekanand and so on. And then it culminates in the first decade of the 20th century by, with two remarkable thinkers. One of them is Aurobindo Ghosh, today remembered as the Saint Sri Aurobindo, but in fact he is in many ways the father of the revolutionary movement. And the other is Vinayak Savarkar. Between them they laid down the ideological framework and the strategy 
that the revolutionaries would follow over the ne next half century and in fact all the way through not only to Netaji's INA but all the way through to 1946 and the great naval revolt which is the culmination in some ways of their thinking. So what is it that we are trying to do? Well, quite apart from merely carrying out occasional acts of arms resistance, a key to their thinking process was to cause a revolt in the British Indian Army. And as Savarkar wrote clearly in his, uh, in, in, a, in, in his book on the 1857 revolt, this was the key strategy by which India would ultimately become free, which was by undermining the loyalty of the Indian soldier to the British crown. Now the efforts of this first generation of revolutionaries did, not, did, did lead to some networks being created. The networks created in India, particularly here in Bengal, led to the creation of something called the Anishilan Samiti. Now what was the Anishilan Samiti? The Anishilan Samiti was actually a network of Akhadas. Now India from ancient times had always had a network of Akhadas across the country. Most of them attached to temples and monasteries and so on. And they had always been at the forefront of resistance to foreign occupation. They had been at the forefront of resistance to the Turks and the Mughals and even against the British uh, during uh, the earlier phase. So this was not entirely a new idea, the creation of this Anushalan Samiti network. At the same time, you have Savarkar sitting in, in London, in India House, beginning to build an international network. Some of his followers would go on to create cells of Indian revolutionaries in Paris, then ultimately in Berlin. Others would go on and create the Gadarite revolt in North America with the Sikhs, in, particularly along the eastern coast of, uh, uh, sorry, the western coast of North America. But this first generation, unfortunately, by the end of that decade, uh, were arrested. There was, of course, the famous Alipur bomb case here, right here in Cal uh, Calcutta. Uh, but then also, um, the various uh, arrests that were done, including that of Savarkar himself. Both um, uh, Sri Aurobindo um, and Savarkar were arrested. Sri Aurobindo, of course, would come out and escape to Pondicherry, but his brother, Barin Ghosh, would end up along with Savarkar in Kalapani, in the cellular jail. Many members of their, both their teams would end up getting hanged. And that ended the first generation. But there would be survivors who would be inspired by this. So the second generation of this would arise with Raj Bihari Bose, in particular, Sachindranath Sanyal, whose grandson, incidentally, is right on the dais, Saurabh, and um, many others. Now, they would carry out many acts of resistance, including almost managing to kill the um, uh, the, uh, the Viceroy of India in Chandni Chowk in 1912. But their real big effort was to try and cause a big revolt in the uh, British Indian Army in the First World War. This is often forgotten. It's called the Gadarite Rebellion. What Raj Bihari Bose and Sachin Sanyal did to get, together with many of their Sikh allies who were coming back from North America to join this was to infiltrate all the regiments in the British Indian Army. And they had been all primed to go into a major revolt in February 20th of 1915. It was all set up, but unfortunately, just a couple of days before this revolt was supposed to take off, a mole managed to penetrate this, uh, this, uh, the, uh, the, the planners of this and inform the British. Overnight, all the Guards at the armories were changed from Indian to European and the revolt never happened except in one place which is in Singapore where the local, uh, where an Indian regiment that was uh, based there did revolt and hold Singapore for about a week where it was put down. Although this particular effort did not succeed, it did continue to get a lot of support now from the Germans who realized that there was potential in trying to 
caused trouble for the British Empire. Of course, they were doing this in Russia as well. Not many people know that the Bolshevik Revolution was very much a German plot to derail the Allies at that time. But in India, they began to help the uh, revolutionaries. By this time, however, Raj Bihari Bose had, had been forced to escape to Japan, and we will catch up with him a little later. And Sachin Nath Sanyal had been shipped off to Kalapani. Many other members of their team had been hanged, killed, shot, and so on. But the Germans then began to prepare for taking a large consignment of guns. In fact, they bought 30,000 rifles and put them on a ship and tried to land them on Odisha coast. And the person who was supposed to receive these guns was, a, was Bagha Jyotin. Many of you have heard of Bagha Jyotin, but I am quite sure many of you don't realize how significant this effort that he was doing was. And Bagha Jyotin, as he's waiting there on Balasore coast for these guns to arrive, unfortunately what happens, the British again find out about this because a German agent switches sides and informs them about this plot. The guns are never reach India because they are, they are stopped in, as they are coming through the Dutch East Indies. And Bagha Jyotin is apprehended and um, there's a gunfight uh, and of course he dies as a result of the wounds from that gunfight uh, in Odisha. So this particular effort again fails. But that too does not end. What is going on here is that there are all these uh, nationalist Sikhs and also some Maharashtrians based in North America. They decide that they are going to join the fight. Some of them do try to do various things in Thailand and so on, but I'm going to talk about a particular character called Pandurang Khankoji, who then makes his way all the way to Persia, where he is backed by the Germans and the Turks to try and take a rebel group of both Indians and Persians and various other groups and try and invade India through Balochistan, from Persia into Balochistan. And guess who is the person who is sent out to, to sort of fight him off? The gentleman called Reginald Dyer. So the same Dyer of the Jallianwala Bagh fame originally earned his name finding Pandurang Khangoji. Of course, while all of this is going on, the war comes to an end, the Germans lose. Pandurang Khangoji finds himself stuck in Persia. He escapes first to Russia and then makes his way to Mexico where he becomes a very famous uh, agricultural scientist and many of the discoveries he makes is ultimately responsible for the Green Revolution in India. So he does ultimately come back to India in the 1950s, but I am digressing here. So the war ends. Now all the, all the soldiers begin to come home. Now remember, these soldiers had been already radicalized by Gadarite thinking. And so the British are very scared that they will revolt. Not only are they, had they been radicalized to start with, they are now veterans and so experienced and they have lost their fear of t killing white people. This is not a trivial thing in the context of the time. So this is the context in which the Rowlett Acts are enforced. They are draconian acts to try and suppress these people. And of course, it spirals out into a series of uh, protests uh, and massacres. And, and of course, the biggest massacre of them all is the Jallianwala Bagh massacre in 1919. Again, the reason I'm telling you all of this is that you can clearly see that many of these events, including the Jallianwala Bagh massacre and so on, had everything to do with the activities of the revolutionaries. You will get the impression, sadly, from reading conventional history that it had something to do with a small Congress party protest in Jallianwala Bagh itself. But if you didn't know the wider history, it doesn't make sense of why this massacre happened and why Reginald Dyer specifically had been sent there. It had everything to do with suppressing the Gadarites. Now, of course, there's a lot of condemnation of this Jallianwala Bagh massacre. So as a result of which, some of the, as a peace move, some of these revolutionaries are released in 1920. This includes Sachindranath Sanya. And he comes back, he does not participate, interestingly, in the non-cooperation movement, which, as you know, after Chauri Chaura comes to a grand halt, and there are a large number of disaffected youths. So what does Sachindranath Sanyal do? He begins to gather up all these pieces into a new movement of resistance. And he creates this big umbrella organization called the Hindustan Republican Association. And this is 
And as a part of that, he writes a constitution for this association, which is remarkable. Because he, for the first time, enunciates the idea that after independence, India would be a democratic republic based on universal suffrage. Now notice that this is a time when the, the Indian National Congress is still arguing for dominion status. This is also a time when universal suffrage is uncommon around the world. Even Britain manages to get, uh, give women the vote only in 1928. So, the first time that Indians clearly enunciate the idea that we will be completely free, we will be a democratic republic based on universal suffrage, comes, this idea comes from the revolutionaries. And as a part of the HRA, Sachin Sanyal then begins to recruit all over the country. And many of the people he recruits, their names you will know. Bismil, Ashwakulla Khan, Bhagat Singh, Sukhdev Thapar, um, uh, and so on and so forth. Here in Bengal, there are many, many uh, important characters, for example, like uh, Master Das, Sen, and so on. This generation, too, faces a crisis. After the Kakodi case, the Kakodi train robbery case, many of this generation of revolutionaries are either caught, several of them are hanged, including Rajendra Lahiri, Ish uh, Ashwakulla, and Bismil. Uh, Sachindra Sanyal was considered too important to be martyred, so they sent him off, packed him off back to Kalapani for another 10 years. And suddenly again the revolutionaries found that they didn't have any leadership. Now, very young leadership pops up. This includes Chandrasekhar Azad in particular, but also others like Bhagat Singh and, and many of that generation of, of revolutionaries. They also carry out various acts of resistance, including killing Saunders as a revenge against the, ki uh, of, against the killing of uh, Lala Lajpat Rai. Uh, Bhagat Singh famously throws the bomb in the Central Assembly in Delhi, which is now the parliament. And there's the big Chittagong arm Armory revolt and uh, Armory raid that happens in Chittagong, uh, led by Master Dashrut Joshen. Again, there is a cycle of fighting, repression, and so on. Some of it happens right next door in, in writer's building. You may know, all of you know, who BBD Bagh is named after today. So, all three of them fought, uh, Binay Bandhu Dinesh fought a famous gunfight called the Battle of the Veranda, uh, right next door in writer's building. And then that cycle also comes to an end. Now, by this time, the revolutionaries are exhausted. Interestingly, also the Indian National Congress itself is also quite exhausted because they have be, there's been continuous amount of resistance to the, to the British, but so far it has yielded no results. So here we are in late 1930s. There is a whiff of war again in the air. And yet again, Sachindranath Sanyal is released from jail. He comes back. He this time goes and stays in Lucknow. And then he travels around various places. And there's a whiff of war. And this war, by this time, even in 1938, they think will involve Germany and will involve Japan. So he contacts his old colleague, Raj Bihari Bose. And we have letters that go back and forth between them, in which they discuss who shall we contact in the, in, in, the, in the INC to sort of give this a more political push? And of course, they reach out to Subhash Chandra Bose. And they have a very famous meeting in the sidelines of a Durga Puja in Lucknow. In, I think it was 1938. So, I mean, I suppose it's quite fitting that two Bengalis meet uh, at the sidelines of a Durga Puja. That Durga Puja in Lucknow, by the way, still happens. And they decide that they are going to basically um, use this as an opportunity yet again to try and incite the British Indian Army. The British know that something is up. They incidentally are keeping track of these, all this communication between these two and uh, Raj Bihari Bose in Japan. So what they do is as the war in 1939 begins to gather pace, they arrest both of them. 
you all know the story of, of, of course, how Netaji escapes and reaches uh, Germany and so on. Uh, Sachin Sanyal is sent back to jail. He contracts t TB in jail, uh, where he was deliberately uh, infected and he would die from that disease. But ra meanwhile, Raj Bihari Bose finds his way to Singapore. And it is Raj Bihari Bose who actually founds the Indian National Army. Many people mistakenly think that it was Netaji founded the INA. It is not the case. It's actually Raj Bihari Bose who was doing it. And this was not his first attempt. He had attempted to do exactly this thing in the First World War as well. But it's, he has a problem. He's a very old man by this point and he feels that he cannot carry on, his health is faltering. So it is on his request that Netaji is uh, brought by submarine, as you know, to Singapore, and he takes command of the INA. I'm not going to tell you this again, the subsequent story, which is relatively better known as well. But as you know, the INA reaches the borders of India, it enters uh, Manipur, it enters Nagaland, uh, there's pitched battles, but in the end, the Japanese lose the war. Uh, in fact, the Axis overall lose the war. And um, Netaji, depending on your belief, goes, either is killed in a plane crash or goes missing at the very least. But this is too not the end of the story. And I'm going, I'm going to take just a few more minutes in case I'm running over time. Here we are in 1945, the end of 1945, the war has ended, the Allies have won. But all the Allied troops are exhausted. They all want to go home. So one by one, they begin to go home. The Americans go home, the British troops go home, the Australians go home, all of them begin to go home. So who is left controlling all these territories and all those hundreds of thousands of Japanese prisoners of war? It is the British Indian Army. So in the end of 1945, the British Indian Army controlled the entire territory from Egypt, across the Arabia, across the Indian subcontinent, through Burma, to Malaysia, Singapore, what is now Indonesia, but then called the Dutch East Indies, all the way to Vietnam. All of this territory is controlled by the British Indian Army. And there is a real problem, because it is holding onto territories where, which had also been former colonies. And many of these old former colonial masters, the French and the Dutch, etc., want to come back and reoccupy these places. But the, but the nationalists of all these countries now have guns, because basically when the Japanese surrendered, they just handed over their guns to the Indonesians or, or the Vietnamese or whoever happened to be there. So there are these pitched battles. For example, when the Dutch try to go back into Indonesia, the Indonesians rise in revolt and throw them out. So guess who is sent in to suppress them? The British Indian Army. And in the pitched battles in Java, thousands, in fact tens of thousands of Indonesian nationalists get killed in these fights. But also hundreds of Indian soldiers also die in this. Now you can imagine the Indian soldier was not happy at, by this situation. It is one thing to have fought the Axis it is even one thing to try and recover the British Empire from this. But the British handing over their soldiers to try and recover the empires of every friend they happened to have along the way was a bit too much. So there was a real, suddenly all of a sudden, there was real grumbling going on inside the British Indian Army. And the British were suddenly scared that there might be a revolt. This is also the time when the INA trials started. That's why it's important. This is, I wanted to tell you this long story so you know the context of the, the INA trials. When the INA trials happened, British, British, uh, 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 British Indian Army soldiers as well as the general public finally found out the true scale of the, what Netaji had done. Because of wartime censorship, they didn't quite know quite what had happened. But suddenly they knew that there had been this army of liberation that had, not, that had not only reached the border, but in fact, in fact, even entered the Indian territory, that there were tens of thousands of soldiers who had participated in all of this. And so suddenly this idea of revolt also begins to spread all over the place from, as I said, Egypt all the way through to Vietnam, British Indian Army 
armed forces begin to really grumble. And this is the context in which in February of 1946, a very big revolt takes place. It's the naval revolt in Mumbai in which 20,000 veterans of the Royal Indian Navy revolted. They captured 77 ships in the harbor. Now, do remember that they are not, um, you know, uh, uh, novices. They, these were the same people who had fought the Japanese just a few months earlier. And they, so the British, using their older era tactics, they said, okay, well, let's send in, you know, people from some other communities to try and suppress them. They had succeeded by using, for example, the Sikhs and the Gurkhas in the 1857, for example. So they send in the Marathas. So the Marathas turn up in and around the harbor area in Mumbai, and they're told to fire. But after half an hour of firing, the British realize that the Marathas are deliberately firing to miss. That is the point it must have been very clear to them that the game was over. They then request the Royal Indian Air Force pilots to fly in their Spitfires and bomb many of these ships in the harbor. These, these aircraft were at that time in northern India. They fly down to Jodhpur and then suddenly, miraculously, all of them develop engine troubles. Similar things happen in Karachi, in Kolkata and so on. So it is during the Naval Revolt of 1946 that Attlee finally announces the Cabinet Commission for Indian in Independence. What Savarkar had thought about in the 1910s, 1900s, what Raj Bihari and Sachin Sanyal and the Gadarites had attempted to do in the First World War, what Netaji, Raj Bihari and others had attempted to do again in the Second World War, finally happened in 1946. The British, uh, British Indian Armed Forces were in open revolt and it was no longer possible for the British to control India. That is the context, ladies and gentlemen, in which India got its freedom. Thank you very much. Sanjeev Sanyal, brilliant, absolutely wonderful account of uh, the role of revolutionaries and in India achieving freedom. Uh, so the naval revolt, as you all know, as he very rightly said, was put the final nail on the coffin. And of course, this was really uh, because of uh, the, the, uh, the trial of the three uh, INA officers that the country were up on its feet and protested. And the British made this mistake of putting on trial a Punjabi Sikh, a uh, North Indian Hindu, and a uh, frontier province Muslim uh, on, on trial. And so they finally did reach Delhi, Chalo Delhi, but at the expenses of the British. So at India's most glorious hour, we didn't have Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose, but such men may pass away physically, but their soul carries on within all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now going to hear what we have been waiting to for all this while. Uh, the address from the guest in chief, uh, the Honorable Governor of West Bengal, Dr. C. V. Anand the Bose. Dr. Anand the Bose uh, is a former member of the Indian Administrative Service, a very eminent civil servant. He is an expert in housing, an innovator, writer, and orator. He retired at the rank of Chief Secretary, the Secretary to the Government of India. Uh, after retirement, he was appointed Chairman of the Government of India Public Sector Undertakings, Central Warehousing Corporation, and Central Railside Warehousing Company Limited. He is also Chairman of the Habitat Alliance in consultative status with the United Nations uh, ECOSOC and was member of the United Nations Habitat Governing Council. He has worked as Vice Chancellor, Secretary to the Chief Minister of Kerala, District Collector, Principal Secretary in various ministries. He has been a Chairman of the Working Group to prepare and submit a development plan to the Prime Minister. He had also submitted notes to the Prime Minister 
Shri Narendra Modi on Housing for All and Women's Empowerment. The Nirmithi Kendra founded by him to promote low-cost housing has been replicated all over India and his Innovation District Tourism Promotion Council has become part of the national tourism policy. We all know him as such an able administrator and he has been hailed across the country as the Lord of Ideas by successive governments. But he is, in addition, a prolific writer, not just of fact, but of fiction as well. He is a columnist. Dr. Bose has published 32 books in English, Balalam and Hindi, including novels, short stories, poems and essays. Some of his books have become bestsellers. He is the recipient of the prestigious Jawaharlal Nehru Fellowship and fellow of the Lal Bahadur Shastri National Academy of Administration. Dr. Bose has been a recipient of 25 international and national awards for his outstanding contributions in, in various fields. In recognition of his pioneering efforts in the field of housing, the United Nations has selected his initiatives as the global best practice no less than four times. The Government of India awarded him the National Special Habitat Award. He was the head of the prestigious Supreme Court Committee on the Treasure of Sri Padmanha Swami Temple. And he is an internationally renowned orator. He has addressed many uh, global fora, including the United Nations General Assembly, United Nations Habitat at Nairobi, and international meets in different countries. He was the best speaker of the Kerala University in his student days and he used to top in the debates of the IAS Training Academy at Missouri, which trains the top government officials of India. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. C.V. Ananda Bose. <laughs> Dr. Bose, we welcome you to the lectern on a very special day. Apart from this day where we are celebrating Azadi Kamrit Mahotsav and the legacy of Bose, this is the day 82 years ago when Shubhashan de Bose left home on Elgin Road on his great escape at 1.30, around 1.30 at night, and which of course charted out a new chapter in India's freedom struggle, transforming him from the fiery patriot Shubhashan de Bose to the uh, warrior statesman Nethaji at the head of the Indian National Army. A very warm welcome to you, sir, at the lectern. Respected Sri Sanjeev Sanyal, Srimadi Anita Bose, Sri Chantrakumar Bose, Sri Subhesh Chakrabarti, Sri Gavadam Ray, Sri Yashasvi Shop, Sri Subodip Ghosh, and the Voice King of Kolkata, Sri Ganguly. My very dear friends, it gives me immense delight to be invited to speak on this occasion when the Nataji Subhash Chandra Bose Memorial Lecture is happening every day. First of all, let me congratulate our young friend Mr. Saniel for the revealing book on the outstanding, unknown, and lesser-known revolutionaries which he has written. As Milton says, a good book is a precious lifeblood of a master spirit. Thank you, Mr. Sanyal, for enlightening us with a brilliant account of the revolutionaries of India who made freedom happen. When we are celebrating Azadi Kambad Mahotsu, on the 75th anniversary of India's independence, we salute the two leaders of substance who made it happen. Mahatma Gandhi, the father of the nation, 
and subhash chandra bose the leader of the nation it is gurudev rabindranath tagore who said netaji subhash chandra bose is desh nayak leader of the nation three cheers to these great men whose combined effort made freedom dawn on india in such a short time when you compare to the other countries which were under subjugation now there is a question this is not history this is history this is not historical fiction there is a lot of fiction going on around as who is responsible for the freedom of this nation i think there is an attempt rightly or wrongly wrongly certainly yes in my point of view of dumping the memories of netaji subhash chandra bose and the rest of us of history who is responsible for this is a moot question now yes the responsibility for this is to be detected and responsibility has to be fixed i remember there is a yoruba folk tale among the norwegian tribe nigerian tribe yorubas truth and untruth are siblings one day untruth asks truth let us go for a swimming contest in the river a friendly contest truth agreed they went to the bank of the river truth took off the clothes jumped into the river and started swimming what did untruth do untruth took away down the clothes of truth and walked majestically to the city to the town seeing truth or thinking untruth masquerading as truth is truth the city the people of the town the townsmen they greeted untruth jeered him jeered him and hailed him high when truth comes back after the swim he sees that his clothes are not there all that is left are the clothes of untruth truth decided i'll never ever wear the clothes of untruth even for a moment so truth walk to the town without any clothes on that is how the phrase naked truth came in seeing naked truth the townsmen jeered at him poo pooed him ridiculed him humiliated him but later the townsmen knew what is truth and what is not they knew untruth masquerading as truth will certainly ca- capture their attention for some time but truth like murder will one day be out that is what mr saniel has also done he has exposed the truth behind the history behind the revolution here i i would like to share a confidential secret with you yesterday i was with nadaji boss every day i am with nadaji boss every minute i am with nadaji boss i am my father an old man in a village in kerala who is a devotee of netaji bose he was in the freedom struggle his hero of course he respected gandhi ji but his hero was none other than the one and only netaji subhash chandra bose <laughs> i have breathed there with netaji breath i have walked the muddy path with meda ji walked because every day my father used to tell us about neta ji boss and what did he tell us he told us that neta ji boss was once an ics officer of the fourth rank in the ics selection that is not a great thing when neta ji came to call on the governor general in the rajpavan the present rajpavan he was told by the authorities he cannot bring your umbrella before his majesty the governor general what did the young man netaji say this umbrella represents a symbol of the dignity of the male in bengal i will carry this otherwise i am not do not want to meet the governor general of india and then what did he did after some time realizing that the coveted position of ics is not important the freedom of the common man is important he resigned from the indian civil service because he was indian he was civil he was service minded not like the is neither indian 
I don't want to further continue for that. Bass back. It is Macaulay who decided to select members of the Indian Civil Service. He said we should select the best and the brightest in the nation, in the empire. That is how the selection was made. You know, before the ISIS officers were sent to India, I was told they were taught two golden rules. Rule one, an ICS officer is always right. Rule two, when an ICS officer goes wrong, rule one will apply. <laughs> Netaji quit the Indian civil service and plunged into the freedom struggle of India. What did my father teach us again? He told us that Netaji decided that great escape in 1941 from prison, from the house arrest, how he traveled to Peshawar and from there to Germany, how he met Adolf Hitler to seek support for the revolutionary movement which would result in the freeing this nation. Then how? It was rightly pointed out by Sanyal Ji here. Yes, it was Rash Bihari Bose who is the father of INA. But INA was rewarmed and taken to its present form by none other than Nadaji Subhash Chandra Bose. His dangerous travel under the sea, first in the German submarine and then in the, it, the, the Japanese submarine, is all part of great history of valor. Yes, in 1943, in 1943, 30th December, independent India's flag was hosted by Nadaji Bose in the Gymkhana Club in Port Bear. My father wanted to go and see the place, but he could not. Now it fell to my lot that I could go there and ground zero and see where Nedaji Bose unfurled the national flag of independent India, Azad Hind. Now tell me, I am one who is brought in the tradition of Nedaji Bose. Day in and day out, every day, Every day my father used to tell us the stories of Nadaji Bose. Now, isn't it a strange fate that one of his eight children, we are a very small family, we are only eight children. <laughs> and there is a story behind it. Some people say that, you know, in, in our family, we are the smallest, we are only eight. My father's father, my father's brother and sisters, they are ten children, fifteen children. That was the, you know, the norm of the days. One of my great-grandfathers, it is said, ask the family medico, is it proper for women to have children after 35? The cranky medico replied, not at all, 35 children are more than enough. <laughs> then I think the production line went down. But one, one thing I tell you, when my mother was a postmistress, she took us to her father's house, eight of us. Somebody said, here goes a picnic. And the local English teacher said, looking at eight of us, she quoting Shapir, he said, the hell is empty, all the devils are here. That is the background from which I come. I had the good fortune, fate has put me here. One of the children of the old freedom fighter, my father, I have been destined to come here and work in the land of his great hero, my great idol, Nedaji Subhash Chandra Bose. A small man like me can be compared to great men. I would like to put myself in the shoes of Bharata, Prince Bharata of Ramayana. He kept the Rama Padaka and administered the nation. For me, poor me, I have before me every day when I sit in the chair, the gubernatorial chair, I have the blessing face of Nedaji Subhash Chandra Bose on the wall. I dedicate myself to the, his memory and in his guise, I am trying to carry out my humble task of being the governor of this great state. My inspiration is Nedaji Subhash Chandra Bose. My heritage is Nedaji Subhash Chandra Bose. My lineage is Nedaji Subhash Chandra Bose. My pride is Nedaji Subhash Chandra Bose. Now tell me, I have a question to you. This is a question which young India is asking. This is a question which all discerning Indians are asking. Who obliterated, who obliterated the rightful place of Nedaji Subhash Chandra Bose from the annals of history? Who did that? Who are the culprits? Yes, 
those historians those historians who he treat history not as fact not as fiction but as fictitious history should not be historical fiction we want the travelian to write history not a scot to write historical romances history has been made into a tragical romance by the his masters who is historians this has to change this has to necessarily change i draw your attention to an incident in the mahabharata that day the generalissimo of the kaurava army is drona there is nobody who can vanquish drona in archery this old brahmin he shows the power of his archery in the ground like a whirlwind he destroys the entire pandava army the pandavas knew the end is near extermination is near what do we do there is no question of defeating drona drona is the ultimate in archery but lord krishna said there is a way where there is a will there is a way that is krishna what is that drona has to relinquish arms on his own how is it possible this is a mission impossible krishna said no if drona knows that his dear son ashwatthama is dead then he will voluntarily rel- relinquish his arms taking a cue from this bhima kills an elephant called ashwatthama with his mace and spreads in the battlefield ashwatthama is dead ashwatthama is dead crestfallen drona seeks confirmation from his trusted and dear disciple yudhishthira the samam bonam of truth and dharma yudhishthira to win the war to win the war yudhishthira tells his master drona on his face ashwatthama hatha kunjara ashwatthama is dead in a voice that will reverberate in the ears of drona ashwatthama the elephant in a harsh harsh voice arms fell from the arms of drona truth also fell on the battlefield of dharma now tell me the younger generation is asking the historians you said ashwatthama had a kunjara about netaji bos half truth you said not the full truth but the younger generation is asking the future is asking what is truth i take you to another instance from the bible in the holy bible there is a governor you know he seems to be the prototype of all governors pontius pilate pontius pilate the governor of rome who was ruling Jer- jerusalem in his court in the dock is jesus christ those who accuse him of heinous crimes are the priests kayafas and annas what are the charges against jesus christ he claimed he is a king of jews he claimed he is a son of god he forbade people from paying taxes to the kaiser pontius pilate was in a dilemma this is immortalized by francis bacon what is truth asked jesting pilate and would not wait for an answer when jesus gave the answer the governor pilate knew and he said i do not see any blame in this innocent man but when truth exploded on him the governor pilate instead of acting upon the truth in his accepting the truth he washed his hands off he said i am innocent of the blood of this man jesus was given to his enemies a governor has to stand for the truth a governor has to serve the truth the governor should have the guts to determination the grit to implement what is true and reject what is not true pilate did not do that what happened then therefore jesus was crucified jesus was crucified if history is trying to crucify netaji subhash chandra bos i can tell you the bible gives the answer if there is crucifixion there is resurrection if there is crucifixion there is resurrection we are waiting expectantly along with the old father who is no more for the resurrection of the rightful place of netaji subhash chandra bos in the history of india 
ഐ എം എ ഹംബിൾ ഓക്യുപ്പൻറ്റ് ഓഫ് ദ രാജ് ഭവൻ വിച്ച് ഹഡ് എർലിയർ സോ കോൾഡ് ഗ്രേറ്റ് മെൻ ലൈക്ക് വെലസ്ലി കഴ്സൺ ഹേസ്റ്റിങ്സ് മിൻറ്റോ ഓൺ ദ റാം പാർട്സ് ഓഫ് ദ ഗ്രേറ്റ് പോർട്ടിക്കോ ഓഫ് ദി ഗവർണേഴ്സ് ഹൗസ് ഓഫ് ദി വൈസ് റീഗൽ പാലസ് അറ്റ് ദാറ്റ് ടൈം they pompously told the indians britannia britannia rules of ways they had the audacity to tell us including the people like netaji subhash chandra bose they had the audacity to say my country right or wrong that was the british may i tell you now the very same portico which subhash chandra bose refused to scale if he is not allowed his umbrella to be carried I have the rare opportunity with your support I am going to rename that royal portico Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose portico <laughs> and as a symbol I request the artist please give me a symbol an umbrella to be put there the symbol of the defiance and the dignity which Netaji Bose upheld that is my humble dream yes and then once it is na- renamed i want the youngsters the new generation of bengal to come and say to proclaim to the world to those who said britannia britannia rules of ways proudly proclaim netaji netaji leads the country jai hind thank you now uh, if that is not what inspiration is all about and inspiring speech is all about then i know not what an inspirational speech from a uh, governor is meant to be thank you very much sir for your uh, uh, remarks your uh, fabulous words and you have roused the entire audience here before uh, we close and i invite sri gautam roy the president designate sir ek to ek to sir sir sir, sir to uh, to close the uh, the uh, afternoon with his concluding remarks sir uh, the little bit of work which is left the uh, as you know the phd cci and the bncci have uh, collaborated to bring this even to us the phd cci mr saurav sanal in in particular will felicitate the president and the president designate of the bengal chamber can we bring those two mementos please yeah please thank you very much sir a couple of lines before i invite mr gautam roy the president designate the atom bombs on hiroshima and nagasaki in early august 1945 brought the war in east asia to an abrupt end on august the 15th 1945 exactly 2 years before india's independence netaji issued the last order of a day in a special message to indians in east asia the roads to delhi are many he told his soldiers and delhi still remains our goal urging his civilian fo- followers never to falter in their faith in india's destiny bose expressed his confidence that india shall be free and before long in this mortal world everything perishes and will perish Subhash Chandra Bose had written while in confinement at Presidency Jail in 1940 but ideas ideals and dreams do not as he prepared for a fast unto death 
He was confident that the idea for which one individual was prepared to die would incarnate itself in a thousand lives. That, he believed, was how the wheels of evolution turned and the ideas, ideals and dreams of one generation were bequeathed to the next. No idea has ever fulfilled itself in this world, he asserted, except through an ordeal of suffering and sacrifice. It is his immense sacrifice, ladies and gentlemen, in the sense of Tyag, as taught by Ramakrishna and Vivekananda, and Kurbani, as enshrined on the INA memorial, that has made him the heir to a life immortal. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Gautam Roy, the President designate of the Chamber, for his closing remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege for me, for me on my personal behalf and on behalf of BCCI and PhDCCI to be able to propose a formal vote of thanks and conclude this very special session. Indeed, all of us gone through a session which we will remember forever. Today's program has been simply a matter of awakening deep emotions from within our Indian consciousness. Our sincerest gratitude to Dr. C. V. Anand Bosch, Honorable Governor of West Bengal, for sparing his valuable time, kindly accepted our invitation, and truly inspired us with the spirit of freedom. <coughs> We convey our sincere thanks to Sri Sanjeev Shandal, economist and historian, member Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister, and honorary member to Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry, who is our guest of honor for making this evening not only emotive, but also enriching us with knowledge and learnings about revolutionaries, to each of whom all of us owe our eternal debt of gratitude. It was so special to hear the recorded message of Professor Dr. Anita Bose, daughter of Netaji and senior economist, and Sri Chandra Kumar Bose, grand nephew of Netaji, and the convener, the open platform for Netaji. Our thanks and appreciation goes to the moderator, C.P. Plop Ganguly who is a passionate follower of Netaji and the revolutionaries before him who ignited the flame of Ajadi for all our people. BCCI and PhDCCI would also like to convey our gratitude to our partner MCKV Institute of Engineering and Power Guild Treasuries for joining us and making this session successful. We also convey our thanks to the media and press. May I now request all present here to kindly rise for the national anthem. Janagana manaya dhinayaka jaya he Bharat bhagya vidhata Punjab Sindh Gujarat Maratha Dravid Utkal Banga Vindhya Himachal Yamuna Ganga Utchal Jaladhita Ranga Tav Shubh Name Jage Tav Shubh Aashish Maage Gahe Tav Jaya Gatha जनगण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 हे थैंक यू वेरी मच लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन वी होप यू एंजॉयड uh, the afternoon as much as we did bringing it to you and would you join us for high tea
Yeah. In the Calcutta Gallery, please. Hi, team. 